Hey everyone, this is Ryan here and welcome back to our periodontic series. In this video, we'll talk about the treatment planning process and the typical five phases that should be considered when treatment planning a periodontal patient. So the short-term goal of periodontal treatment is simply to reduce gingival inflammation by correcting conditions that cause it those being plaque accumulation, calculus accumulation, and so on. And so the short-term goal is really focused on comfort and aesthetics. Whereas the long-term goals are a bit more complex and they're focused more on function and health. And so some of these specific long-term goals are to eliminate pain, to arrest hard and soft tissue destruction as measured by the clinical attachment loss, establish occlusal stability and function, to reduce tooth loss, and to recognize that it might not be possible to save all the teeth. Of course, we want to save as many teeth as possible, but within reason, and to prevent the recurrence of periodontal disease in the future. So let's talk about the five phases of periodontal treatment planning. And the first one that I label zero because it's sort of coming before the actual periodontal treatment is preliminary is the preliminary phase. So in the preliminary phase, we want to treat emergencies. This would be um, any urgent care needs like an endodontic or periodontal abscess and to extract hopeless teeth. And this is really, really important. And hopeless is an actual official category of tooth prognosis that we'll cover in depth in the next video. But one of the determining factors of a hopeless prognosis tooth is having bone loss that involves the apex of the tooth where there is hardly any periodontal attachment left and no hope for the periodontal apparatus to be restored and functional. So this tooth in most situations, of course there's always some individual variation uh, from patient to patient based on their oral hygiene and their age, but in most scenarios, this would be considered a hopeless tooth and would deemed best extracted. So how I remember this is preliminary phase has the E for emergencies and E for extraction of hopeless teeth. So the, the first actual phase of periodontal treatment would be the non-surgical phase and sometimes called phase one therapy. So this involves plaque control and patient education. So it's all about control, diet control, caries control. Getting the patient situation under control is really important moving forward. So this involves uh, cleaning, scaling and root planing, and oral hygiene instruction to remove local factors, those being, again, plaque, calculus, and so on to correct restorative irritational factors. We also talked about this in the local factors video, including overhanging margins, maybe some restorations just have to be adjusted a little bit to remove some uh, food retention areas, food impaction areas, or some rough spots that are accumulating a bit more plaque than they should be. This can also involve local or systemic antibiotic prescription, which we'll talk about in a separate video, and the periodontal reevaluation is very important. This is where you'd assess any improvements in the patient's periodontal health. You also want to reaffirm the importance of oral hygiene and check in with basically how they're doing. This should occur four to eight weeks after the completion of all the phase one therapy. That would be if you wanted to do scaling and root planing for all four quadrants of their mouth, including oral hygiene instruction, maybe uh, application of fluoride varnish. After four to eight weeks, we can reassess the patient's situation to see if there's been any healing, see if the pocket depths have gotten a little bit more shallow, see if the inflammation has been reduced a little bit. Those would be great signs of healing. They're not necessarily have to be present. Sometimes really deep pockets won't heal. Uh, in four to eight weeks, and it might take much, much longer or more involved treatment to get any improvement. So it is really important at this appointment to be asking the patient how they're doing, how they're keeping up with their oral hygiene routine, and to assess their motivation to improve their situation. Of all the specialties, 
I think periodontics especially, you need to have patient compliance in order to have success. So for the board exam, remember this number, four to eight weeks after completion of the scaling and root planning, that's when you'd want to do the periodontal reevaluation. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this term before, so I do want to make sure I mention this. JE stands for junctional epithelium. And I will draw in this picture here that we had in one of our very first videos in the series. This is the sulcus and this area where the epithelium contacts the enamel directly is known as the junctional epithelium. There's some weak hemidesmosomal attachment to the enamel, but that would be a sign of healing towards a shallower pocket if we have a bit more formation of junctional epithelium and the pocket, the periodontal pocket becomes a bit more shallow. All right, so the next phase, also known as phase two therapy, is this surgical phase. And this is where you'd want to reduce or eliminate periodontal pockets to correct soft and hard tissue defects, regenerate periodontal tissue, or place implants. And this involves periodontal therapy and also endodontic therapy to restore any teeth with endodontic problems. So phase two therapy, in phase zero, we take care of the immediate concerns. So emergencies and extracting hopeless teeth. In phase one, we focus on conservative plaque control, both in office and at home. And then in phase two, we turn to a more surgical strategy. We often have to flap open the gums and gain better vision and access to see the presence of local factors like plaque and calculus, maybe uh, some really deep and tenacious calculus that we just couldn't remove with scaling and root planning, and you need to have better access. So the surgical phase comes into play when the non-surgical phase just isn't proving to be that successful. The third phase, also called phase three therapy, is the restorative phase. And this phase is not reached until after periodontal disease is under control. So you wouldn't start messing around with final restorations and crowns, bridges, and partials until the periodontal situation is under control. And finally, we have the maintenance phase, also called phase four therapy. And that's why I included the numbers the way I did, because they correspond to the actual uh, numerical order of the phases. So the maintenance phase, also called supportive periodontal therapy, is this periodic ongoing evaluation of the patient's oral hygiene and the condition of the periodontal tissues. Again, remeasuring the pocket depths, assessing the inflammation or lack thereof. So periodontal maintenance is performed in continuum with the previous two phases every three months for at least the first year. And then the patient might be able to move to a twice a year schedule, just like regular dental cleanings, if their situation is uh, under nice control. But any patient who ever had a scaling and root planning will be on periodontal maintenance for the rest of their life. And that's because a history of disease is a risk marker for future disease. And speaking of risk, we're going to talk about that right now. So we'll end the video talking about risk elements, and these categories may sound similar, but these are all distinct terms and important to distinguish between for the board exam. So risk factor are those things that are causally associated with the disease. This would be like saying smoking leads to periodontal disease. A risk determinant is some unchangeable background characteristic. This is something that's out of your control that does increase the likelihood of getting disease. So this could be like gender or genetics. A risk indicator, as opposed to a risk factor, is not causally associated with the disease, but could point potentially having a higher risk. So this is like stress, osteoporosis might even influence periodontal disease, but they're not causally directly associated with it. And finally, a risk marker or risk predictor has some quantitative association with disease. This would be like I just mentioned having a previous history of periodontal disease or having some clinical attachment loss. 
All right, and so uh, for some uh, examples of each of the four risk element categories, for risk factors, we have smoking, diabetes, pathogenic bacteria, and microbial tooth deposits. So these two being associated with plaque, which again is the initiating factor and the actual direct cause of periodontal disease. So again, plaque causes periodontal disease, and we've talked about local factors that can contribute to plaque accumulation, all of which are important. But these are sort of bigger picture issues, um, and all of these categories are bigger picture issues at the overall patient level that can help us figure out their risk of getting periodontal disease. So for example, tobacco smoking has a substantial destructive effect on the periodontal on the periodontal tissues. So smoking and more recently diabetes could certainly fit into this category of risk factor being causally associated with the disease process. So some risk determinants, again, these are things that are out of your control, genetic factors, age, gender, and socioeconomic status. Risk indicators are not causally associated with disease. This would be like HIV or AIDS, where the acute necrotizing form of both gingivitis and periodontitis are more, or if, are more often seen in individuals with this immunocompromise. Osteoporosis, as I mentioned, um, has reduced bone mass, which could have an impact on the rate of progression of disease. Infrequent dental visits, that makes sense, and stress can also interfere with normal immunologic function, which, as we went over in the last video, you know that the immune system is very, very, um, very, very involved with the periodontal disease process. So it would make sense that something that messes up with the immune system, like HIV or AIDS or even stress, can mess up with the periodontal health. And finally, risk markers. These are quantitative associations with disease, previous history, bleeding on probing, and most importantly, clinical attachment loss. Clinical attachment loss is one of the most important clinical indicators of periodontal disease and tissue destruction. So it's certainly a risk marker for somebody who may be getting or may have already um, had periodontal disease. All right, so that's it for this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching, everyone. I hope it was helpful in your studies, and we'll see you all in the next video.